Growing up rural Mississippi, obviously a black girl. At the time we were called colored people, Negroes. And my grandmother was a maid, that's all she ever knew. The only real expectation she held for me was that I would one day become a maid and in her words, have some good white folks, meaning people who would not uh, speak negatively about me, who would allow me to take food home, who would be good to me, would treat me with some level of uh, dignity and respect. And when I was separated from my grandmother and sent to live with my mother at six years old, I suddenly land in a place that's completely foreign to me. I don't know anybody. I don't really even know my mother. I just know when people say, that's your mother. I walked into that space feeling completely alone and abandoned with no explanation of why I was being sent away. I remember the first night entering into that house and being told that I wouldn't be able to sleep with my mother and I wouldn't be able to sleep uh, inside the house, but there was a little foyer porch before you actually got inside the house. And I was put outside to, to sleep there. I later realized it's because it was the color of my skin. My mother was boarding with this very light skin um, black woman who could have passed for white. And she just, I could tell instantly when I walked in the room. And when I was 14 years old, I became pregnant and uh, hid the pregnancy for seven months until the baby was born. And I say the baby because I was so disassociated and still do feel such a disassociation. I never felt like it was my baby. And hiding that secret and carrying that shame really blocked me in so many ways that I remember being taken to the detention home when my mother was going to put me out of the house at the age of 14 and being taken to the detention home and waiting to be processed through the detention home and recognizing in that moment that I have been abused since I was nine years old, raped at nine years old, abused at 10 years old, molested for all of those years, and now pregnant as a result of that. And looking around the detention home at all of these girls who'd been placed there for being bad girls. And I remember having a moment thinking, now I am officially a bad girl. I'm now, for the rest of my life, going to be called a bad girl because I'm going to be put in this place. And thinking to myself sitting there waiting to be processed that I really don't belong here and I don't, I don't even know how this happened to me, that I am in a place for bad girls because I didn't feel like I was a bad girl. And as I sat there thinking, I don't belong in this place for bad girls because I'm not a bad girl. A woman comes out and says to myself and to my mother, I'm sorry, Miss Lee, but there's not enough room on our docket for your daughter. You'll have to come back in two weeks. There isn't enough room for her here. And my mother and I had to leave and I was released to go to live with my father. And that was my saving grace. And so from that moment forward, I felt like I had been somehow saved, that somebody up there, out there, recognized that I wasn't a bad girl. And now here I was gonna have another chance. And after I gave birth at 14 years old, to a child that I never even knew how this even happened to me at the time. When that child died, my father said to me, this is your second chance. This is your opportunity to seize this moment and make something of your life. And I took that chance and I got my first job in radio uh, when I was 16 years old, because so, I've been, been broadcasting since I was 16 years old. But my first job I got because I was a great reader. 
And what I found is I wasn't so good at the writing part, but if I was just standing up and talking about what had just happened, it was really good. And then I started to feel, so I started in 19, working in television, became an anchor immediately afterwards. I could feel inside myself that reporting was not the right thing for me, even though I was happy to have the job. Knowing what you don't want to do is the best possible place to be if you don't know what to do. Because knowing what you don't want to do leads you to figure out what is it you, you really do want to do. I was under contract for, and they didn't want to give up the 25,000. So right. they were trying to keep me on to the end of the year. So they put me on this talk, this is the way life works. They put me on a talk show to try to avoid having to pay me the contract out. And the moment I sat on the talk show, interviewing the Carvel ice cream man and his multiple flavors, I knew <laughs> that, that I had it. found home for myself. Because when I was a news reporter, it was so unnatural for me, I, you know, to cover somebody's tragedies and difficulties, and then to not to have feel anything for it. From doing 25 years and thousands and thousands of interviews on The Oprah Show, it does not matter where you come from. I have seen people come out of the desert, walk across the desert, being born in the most dire of circumstances. Doesn't matter what your mama did, whether she did or had a PhD or no D, what matters is now, this moment, and your willingness to see this moment for what it is, accept it, forgive the past, take responsibility, and move forward. In more than 4,500 episodes of her show. Her message was always, you can. You can do, and you can be, and you can grow, and it can be better. And she was living proof. Rising from childhood poverty and abuse to the pinnacle of the entertainment universe. But even with 40 Emmys, the distinction of being the first black female billionaire, Oprah's greatest strength has always been her ability uh, to help us discover the best in ourselves. As you are responsible for your life, and if you're sitting around waiting on somebody to save you, to fix you, to even help you, you are wasting your time because only you have the power to take responsibility to move your life forward.